years and I had absolutely no clue. I felt very guilty again. I felt very guilty, but extraordinarily, I was going through my file of clippings that look a lot like the ones back here, and I found an article out of the Tribune dated October 28, 1963. It was kind of doing a catch-up on the survivors and what was happening, and there was a picture of Karen Van Horn and her two children. Uh, and Connie was about two and a half by then. And uh, you better believe I'm going to give that picture to Connie. Uh, and it was just uh, kind of that moment where suddenly all of this started to gel together. I think the, probably the most uh, moving experience for me came when my first child was born. And this is six years later, 19, May May 13th, 1966. And I saw and witnessed that wonderful creation of life uh, in front of me. Mysterious thing that happens. Well, we know what causes it, but it's a mysterious thing that happens that you don't, that you kind of take for granted. And I, and I looked at that baby and I said, you know, we are given a, a blessing of life and, um, and how we treat that life is, is going to be the test of who we are. Some of us didn't have the choice of fulfilling our lives. Others of us have had. So for me, the, the lesson that I've learned over the 46 years of this has been that we can't take anything for granted. We can't take life for granted. And I've learned that all of us, each of us, can walk out of this room and not see tomorrow. And uh, we may have some control, but most of the time we don't have any control over that. So it's, it's today, how we treat each other, how we, um, how we spend our time, how we hug our families, what we teach our families, um, is something that I think I walk away with as a legacy to why I was given the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank all of you who were at Cal Poly at the time, who were very understanding, very supportive, and heaven knows I had no clue about the impact that it had on you. And I know it had a major, major impact on all of you, especially those who were responsible for making arrangements and scheduling travel and, and being the s stewards of our lives as we performed um, and were involved in functions uh, supported by the, the university. Um, I will never forget that day, and nor do I ever want to forget that day, because if I do forget, then I will forget those uh, very special people that I miss greatly. Um, Friday, we'll have an opportunity to, to meet them all again in the form of a monument, which hopefully we'll all be able to uh, visit, touch, read about them, look into their eyes, and tell them we miss them. Thank you very much. to introduce uh, Lauren Nicholson, who was an emeritus professor uh, me. <laughs> at the time of the crash, and he's going to tell you about his experiences of, of hearing from all over the world as, a, uh, as the journalistic world gathered to, to find out more about the Cal Poly crash. Lauren? I just had this in front of me here for the last uh, half hour, and I put it here when the girls came in uh, with their the, this this postcard to their father, the the two daughters who are here today, and um, 
Uh, this was Johnny Nettleship, who was a sports editor at the time in 1916, who was on the plane and who was uh, badly injured. He was in the hospital back there for some 25 weeks. And um, he was, as you can see from the postcard, this uh, postcard, he was at Mercy Hospital. Uh, Johnny did come home and uh, for, and for until just recent years, he was attending the retired active uh, men's uh, meeting each week and, uh, and was always uh, present. And we got such a great kick out of, out of him because he had so many wonderful stories to tell all those years. But I guess even after coming home, he was still doing a certain amount of retiring. He could only work two or three hours a day for a long, long time at the newspaper until he retired. I had the chance, and once this assignment was made, to talk to some wonderful people who had all kinds of great information that was more than useful, and to run into all kinds of unbelievable coincidences, and uh, in, in, in connection with the media, too. I became fascinated with, with the way that information can move from person to person to person, and how each person takes hold to carry out their duty, their part of the, the necessity of what they must do, and how it all worked out. And what was interesting to me was then, was first and to have a, a, an opportunity to talk to, uh, to, talk to our, our executive vice president at that time, Bob Kennedy. Bob uh, was at a meeting and received, uh, received uh, someone came up and whispered to him that, that there was a telephone call for him. He tried to waylay the phone call because he was, had some part in the program, but they insisted that it was it's, that they had said it was really important. So he went back to the phone and he uh, found himself talking to the uh, one of the uh, one of the, the reporters at the newspaper, and the reporter said, "Our editor wanted me to call you." He says, "We've got some stuff coming in over the wire that you'll want to know about," and so and 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 I guess mentioned that the plane in Toledo had crashed. So Bob left the meeting, went down to the Tribune where he could follow the pattern of our, and, and keep track of what was happening, what new information as it came out. And the object, of course, was to, uh, to, to, to make major decisions about what should come next because the circumstances were such that our president, Julian McPhee, was on his way to, for a month's vacation in Europe, and he had made a stopover in Washington, D.C. to do perhaps some lobbying or to talk to some legislators before continuing his journey. So uh, President McPhee wasn't around to say anything, but now for the first time, or maybe not the first time, I won't say that, now the man who was to become our president was in full charge as executive vice president and had to move, had to make, had to, uh, make information available in a lot of places. First, he called um, Everett Chandler. Everett here today? He called Everett Chandler because uh, Everett was nominally in a charge of all affairs related to the students, including all the sports activities. And Kennedy's first instruction was for him, in his position, to go back as quickly as possible to Toledo. And so he, took, he, he left to do that. He then started on a, on a cam phone campaign to locate uh, uh, 